digitaljamsessions.com Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam session, our last VR Writers Room session. And today we are joined by Rihanna, Phil, Charlie, Dave, Jeff, Kathleen, Kevin and Steve, who I am going to allow to introduce themselves to explain a little bit more about who they are and exactly which industries they work within. And we'll start off with you, Phil. Hi, I'm Phil Harris. I am a narrative designer. I create worlds for video games and role-playing games and some other work as well. Wonderful, thank you. And Kevin? My name's Kevin Williams. Uh, I'm the uh, director of KWP. I also run the DNA Association. We work in the digital out-of-home entertainment sector, which also includes immersive entertainment such as VR. Wonderful, thank you. And Dave, why don't you explain to us a little bit more about what you do? My name is Dave Cook. I am Digital Account Manager at marketing agency Digitas LBI. I'm a video game freelance journalist and I'm also a comic author. Wonderful, thank you. And Rihanna, why don't you tell us about your illustrious career? I'm Rihanna Patchett and I'm a writer, um, predominantly working in video games, but also doing uh, some work in comics, movies, TV and short stories. Wonderful, thank you. And Charlie, why don't you tell us more about what you do? Kia ora koutou. Hello, I'm Charlie McDermott. I'm a creative entrepreneur and I work across technology and the entertainment industry. Wonderful, thank you. And Steve, why don't you tell us all about what you do at Amplified Robot? Hi, well, I'm Steve. Uh, yeah, I'm the CEO of Amplified Robot, and Amplified Robot does anything and everything to do with augmented reality and virtual reality. Wonderful, thank you. And Kathleen, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Sure, I'm Kathleen Wallace. I am a multi hyphenate writer, actor, direct, uh, producer, creator, at working both in theatre and on the web, and uh, CEO of Shauna Key Communications. Wonderful, thank you. And Jeff, why don't you tell us all about Starlight Runner? Sure, Starlight Runner Entertainment uh, is a New York-based production company. I am uh, Jeff Gomez, the CEO of the company, and we specialize in consulting with uh, the big uh, movie studios and big brands on a narrative and um, how to extend story uh, in different ways across different media platforms. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. I am Tanya, the founder of Digital Jam and your friendly guide and host for this VR Writers Room session. So... Today we are going to be focusing on the topic of narrative. Now we did a little bit of homework and some of the the group had some thoughts around what the key points are and what the most important focus areas are in terms of narrative. And one of the the interesting points that kind of came out via uh, Charlie was uh, in and around this idea of a, I hate to describe it as a a dungeon master (laughs) or a gatekeeper, but that's kind of what it sounded like in your description, Charlie. But this idea, this notion of somebody who is helping to guide your narrative experience. And Charlie, I'd love for you to expand a little bit on this this, uh, this theory. Yeah, sure. I mean, I I guess um, we've covered a lot of of kind of traditional uh, narrative techniques and how the audience will interact with those and and where, and I'm sure that will be covered today by people who are much more experienced in that than I am. But I guess um, the work we've been doing uh, with, uh, some augmented reality and 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 where the technology is heading is allowing um, a way that the device or the companion that the user is viewing uh, the content through to analyze uh, the user's movements, emotional, uh, what's happening with them emotionally. Um, we can we know how they might be able to walk. We know some information about them from their previous online history. So whether there is a technology that can analyze all of that data to release a narrative that is specific to that particular user. Um, And I guess the dungeon master or the game master idea, we've talked about it before, but came out of obviously Dungeons and Dragons, where there's a human who is controlling not only the gameplay, but also the emotional narrative or the drive of the story from from an overarching game perspective. Mm. So whether there is a way that that this, I think someone else mentioned the voice of God or who who is um, someone or some technology that is able to yeah, empathetically, I guess, guide an, an individual experience or an individual person through this experience. That was just a question, really, whether anyone thought that was might be relevant one day. 
Well, I'm actually going to go off on a complete tangent and, and I'm going to ask you to comment on this, Jeff, once I've, I've gone on this tangent. But I was having a conversation with somebody today about something very similar to this, but not in the narrative sense, in the sense of um, commercialization and advertising. And we, we had this discussion about the, the plausibility and the differences between just taking existing 2D advertising and just kind of literally putting it on a billboard in a immersive VR environment. To which I kind of said, well, that's not terribly, you know, interesting. And it's, it's not necessarily the, the, the best way of, of translating uh, a, a commercial message into a VR environment. And then we discussed this idea of this artificial intelligence, this artificial character that is kind of with you in your experience and and you know it was almost like the digital equivalent of you know a hawker coming at you <laughs> with advertising and saying you know hey would you like to buy this would you like to buy that and, and then we kind of t we, we evolved that conversation into this idea of you know the waiting room the lobby before you enter your vr experience with you know those multiple doors that you can enter and this idea that there's you know this best buddy this friend of yours who happens to be there and knows all about what you like and what you don't like and you know they they know about that that pair of shoes that you might quite like you know to buy and that they're maybe they're wearing them wearing the the t-shirt of your favorite football team and they're telling you all about the new t-shirt that you should be buying um and would that be the next evolution of advertising within the context of a, a virtual environment i'm interested to hear your thoughts on this jeff because it's kind of a hybrid role isn't it really of, of kind of the the gatekeeper, the, the kind of dungeon master, but also kind of an advertising person, kind of, you know, in there trying to sell you things? <laughs> um, well, that's it's interesting. Uh, I was just uh, speaking with uh, Jonathan Mildenhall. He is the uh, chief marketing officer of Airbnb right now. Mm. He used to be the vice president of uh, global uh, uh, marketing strategy for Coca-Cola. Uh, I worked with Jonathan on um, Open Happiness, um, uh, uh, the massive uh, global ad campaign uh, for Coca-Cola from roughly 2006 to uh, just this uh, January 2016, and it, it ended recently, and, and we, uh, we talked and reminisced about the power of, of taking the Coca-Cola brand and manifesting it in this kind of fantasy world uh, called Happiness Factory, which which manifested around the world uh, in the form of uh, this animated uh, environment, this uh, this place inside a Coke machine, this fantastical world where the characters all uh, worked really hard to build bottles of Coca-Cola for people who were uh, uh, paying for it at vending machines. And um, and it was so fabulous, and we worked so hard to uh, to create this world in great detail, uh, so that it was delightful, so that you actually wanted to enjoy uh, the story of the Happiness Factory and its characters, as opposed to feeling like it was hitting you over the head with bottles of Coca Cola. <laughs> and um, and in doing so, um, we convinced Jonathan to let us uh, con convey um, some positive values, some, some, uh, some kind of uh, aspirational themes, and he really came to understand that, that this was potent. It became tremendously uh, successful worldwide. And, and at one point, he lamented, he said, well, I, I wish there were a way for people to actually go to the happiness factory, uh, for, for people to enjoy it from inside uh, the actual uh, world. Of, of Happiness Factory. You guys worked so hard, so many details that people aren't really seeing in these commercials could be enjoyed there. And, um, and, and I think that he's on to something with regard to uh, what uh, VR can do for brands, because when a brand projects itself uh, in a narrative form um, and thinks about uh, its meaning, its role in the lives of the people who are using the, these products, and, and how this can become fanciful in, in various ways. You can create welcome, immersive uh, environments for people to enjoy, even if it's for 60 seconds or a couple of minutes before the main event um, uh, inside the, uh, the, uh, the, the virtual reality format. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's how I'd uh, uh, kind of want to think about it, not just uh, a kind of hyper-commercial, Mm. But 
it's a, a narrative environment that conveys the values and the meaning behind the product so that you affiliate that with the product. It's interesting that you mentioned this idea of that easing into the environment. Um, I know that Kathleen, one of your comments around this was about how do we ease people into the experiences from a narrative perspective. And I wonder whether or not we, we do think that there is more scope than just, you know, the, the kind of what we've seen so far with the whole watching a movie in, in a, you know, a snow uh, logged cabin somewhere in the hills to, to actually have this environment of the lobby, if you like, the waiting room um, within the VR environment that allows people to kind of ease themselves into the experience. I'm very curious, Rihanna, to hear from you on this one because I know that you've spoken a number of times about the different types of environments and that idea of kind of just removing people from the reality for a moment. I mean, I think there would there will have to be a, a sort of a a transitional moment that's sort of getting people into the game. The, the VR equivalent of the loading screen, really. Mm. Um, and I certainly think the environmental storytelling is going to come into play much more than it ever has in in what we've seen in games so far. Because you know, get, games themselves have a huge real estate for environmental storytelling. I mean, every medium uses environmental storytelling, but what you see sort of flash by and you know, half a second in a movie, in a game, or in a VR environment, you can kind of go up to that thing and you can poke around and, you know, when it comes to VR, you can look at it from all different angles and things like that, um, and, you know, in, interact with it, and so, you know, it, it becomes such a rich canvas for storytelling, so I think we'll see that being used a lot. Um, I mean, it does interest me about how the, the players get into the world and how they interact with it and how that itself, you know, that's one of the points I, I brought up was about how are they going to interact with the narrative? You know, you, you don't have... Well, actually, I mean, in some VR you do get buttons, so maybe there will be a traditional element of gaming because you can use the VR where you're just using you know, hand motions or eye motions and then there's VR where you're sort of using that a little bit, but also using um, uh, like a, a controller as well. So whether it will be a kind of traditional way of interacting with the narrative or, or whether there'll be new ways that are based on the VR technology. Mm. For example, I think I mentioned in the first one I was on uh, Land's End where you sort of manipulate uh, the environment by looking at something and fix, fixing on it and then moving it like a sort of telekinetic power. And that's actually really satisfying and it, it keeps it in, within the VR world. And I think there's something a little bit odd about having a VR world and then you've got your hands in the real world controlling buttons. I don't know how comfortable that's going to be. So anything that just keeps everything controlled in that real world is, is going to be very interesting and the environment will play a big part of that thing. Hmm. It's interesting you bring up that whole thing of being able to see your hands. And I know that, Steve, in your last um, meetup, um, Microsoft and Advisor uh, announced their new SDK, which will be compatible with Unity. But um, one of the things that that SDK is, is doing, it will allow people who are building VR experiences for, you know, a Windows 10 tablet or, or you know, mobile phone, um, they'll actually be able to see the hands. They will be able to track the hands, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's important uh, because I think it's one of the things that uh, people automatically, uh, once they've done the, the, uh, the headset, they, they always look for, first of all, can they see their hands and then can they see their feet? Uh, so, but I th and I think that uh, if you can introduce uh, your natural hands uh, into your environment, just as if they were a in, in front of you in real life, then I think that helps in lots of lots and lots of ways. Hmm. Okay. Now I'm curious because this one is actually one that's been brought up by a couple of of, of different people within this group. Um, in terms of this idea of how much freedom do we give the audience to roam? So is it really a sandbox experience, or from a narrative perspective, do we want to signpost these things? Is it how crucial is it? to handhold this audience and make sure that they're actually seeing certain things. Now, Dave, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the floor in this one because this was one of the points that you raised. So I'm curious to, to hear more in terms of what our thoughts are on the importance of kind of corralling the experience or, or just letting them loose in the world. 
it's an interesting one because in the previous session we did actually discuss this uh, this uh, toss up between um, um, pure freedom, you know, in, in games like uh, Proteus, for example, um, and versus something like Call of Duty, which of course is more um, corridor based, you know, and mm-hmm. and certainly in that game I've I've felt a degree of tedium, you know, waiting for. Um, you know, the people in front of me blocking my way to stop the conversation before I can actually get on with it. You know, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know and, and that's important, though, uh, to say in, you know, if we are giving people a sandbox experience uh, and they go off to the left when, you know, they need to go right to get a vital piece of the information, you know, to, to further their understanding of the world uh, or the appreciation of the world. Of course, we were, we were discussing um, establishing lore within the scenery um, it's quite easy to miss that if you're if you're given free reign. Uh, um, you know, big game right now, of course, is Fallout, and and I've um, I've missed bits of dialogue because I was getting too far ahead of myself. <laughs> and yeah, um, obviously we're not talking in the context of a game strictly, but uh, again, if if there's a narrative cue, uh, a, you know, a nugget of information uh, off to the off to one side, and we're busy looking at the you know the the wonderful skyline, for example, uh, you know, we do run that risk of missing things, uh, and I wonder if that's where the sort of um, the voice of God, if it were, uh, you know, this omnipresent uh, narrator might be a way to do that. So no matter where you are, you can actually hear that dialogue. It doesn't actually matter. It's not so much a visual reference, but an aud- uh, audible one. Mm. Um, it's, 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 dif- it's difficult because sign, signposting certainly in games, it can feel very intrusive. The whole crumb trail mechanic, for example, um, you know, without any sort of hint of uh, the imagination that's left it's basically saying go here you must go here go straight here go this way and and it really stunts your your thirst for creativity uh, and and exploration um i think one in, w- that concept i think i came up in the last session which was um you know break breaking down a, nar- a narrative uh, into episodic chunks can be interesting because if you miss something um, in one episode, maybe you could uh, hammer home the point in, this, in episode two, for example. Or mm. uh, we did also also discuss that concept of a singular event, uh, and then in each installment, you see that event from the perspective of a different player in the story that gives uh, new meaning and sort of builds upon that storyline. Um, so if you miss stuff in the first uh, episode, for example, you, you have a chance to catch up. And mm. it's a very delicate one, but um, there are certainly ways that, um, you know, signposting and, and handholding of the narrative can go very, very wrong. Um, mm. And I'm sure that's not, not something we would fall uh, mm-hmm. prey of here. <laughs> so aside from the, the kind of games approach, I think one of the, the approaches there that you're talking about, the idea of the singular event that's being experienced multiple times from different perspectives is very much kind of a TV approach or, or even a theatre approach to a certain you know degree. And I'm interested, Kathleen, because I know this was also a point that you kind of raised it as well, in terms of that idea of, of you know passive experience versus interactive experience. Um, from a narrative perspective, do you think there is value in that idea of, of kind of approaching it with the you know, single world event with multiple uh, experiences, multiple angles? Do you mean in terms of uh, the value of seeing the same story told multiple times from different mm-hmm. perspectives? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I brought up in a previous uh, talk the Brian Friel's play Faith Healer. Uh, if I didn't, you should look it up. It's one of my all-time favorite plays. It's brilliant. It's one story told from three different perspectives four times. Mm. And it's it's kind of what we were just talking about with, with every time the story is told, you get a little bit more information. And so it's really, in a way, like mosaic storytelling, where the audi- the picture for the audience is filled in bit by bit little tiny piece little by little tiny piece so that by the end of the show, by the end of the experience, you have a much fuller, much richer picture of what has happened and what the story is. And, and it allows you and your imagination to fill in the pieces in between. So as a writer, I'm, I'm curious and interested because you use this phrase, and I, I just want to get an excuse to use the phrase, your, your, your free range audience. <laughs> <laughs> your free range audience, the, the, the hens that you're letting wonder about this world. Um, from, from your perspective, do you as a writer want to write for a free range audience or do you want to write for an audience that you know are going to be kind of getting these tidbit pieces as they go? I mean, how does that change your perspective as a writer? Well, I think it's 
le- it's more for me about the appeal of the challenge of each, where if the, the more free range the audience is, then the challenge for me as a writer is how do I ensure that they're getting all the information that they need to have in order to move forward, particularly in a serialized environment where presumably in each subsequent episode, you would need information from a previous episode to know where the narrative is heading and, or, or get the full picture. Mm. And so, I mean, it, 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 that challenge to me is so interesting. You know, the, the can you play with, for example, light, where there's, there's a light source in one corner of the room and, and nothing seems to be happening. So the audience has to look around and then oh, maybe they see the light or is it sound or, or is it that they that one newspaper keeps showing up again and again, and maybe this time I should pick it up and see what it's all about. And, uh, and so it's less about the, the limitations of, okay, well, how am I going to do this? And more about how, okay, here's something that we haven't tried before. How are we going to rise to this challenge? I am curious, from your perspective, Charlie, obviously with something like the Generation of Z, to a certain extent, extent you're, you're, you're kind of utilising this mosaic storytelling approach that Kathleen is talking about. And I'm curious to hear from your perspective what your thoughts are in terms of that, that challenge, as Kathleen puts it, of writing for an audience that, that is potentially free roam, but who you actually do want to guide through this story. Yeah, and you, I mean, you said the biggest challenge in, in your question, which is the audience. Every night we used to say we have a char- the biggest character in the show is turning up and no one's rehearsed with them, <laughs> you know, and it is the audience. And so you need to provide in your script a whole lot of options, backups. Um, the, the, the actors themselves need to be very au fait with improvisation um, because those moments, that are the behaviours that an audience might take do dictate to an extent some of the narrative or at least might hold it up or speed it up. So there is, a, there is that human interaction element that will always need to be there when this does translate to VR. And um, it was, uh, yeah, mo- the multiple storylines, simultaneous storylines are very exciting, but they do, they're not just, oh, cool, I'll write four storylines at the same time and put four different groups in four different rooms. It's not as simple as that. It did take us quite a few years to, as I said, really start working out the user experience or how the audience was reacting to the story and to this narrative. And as we know, you know, I'm a stickler on that, that the first pillar was about the audience. And I still think that there is a lot more um, to be done and a lot more research and a lot more work uh, to be done on how the audience and how the user is interacting with uh, whether it's a VR technology or in this case, you know, we're talking about an immersive theatre narrative. Okay. Kevin, I'm interested to hear from your perspective then, from obviously from an out of home kind of uh, theatre, well, theme park experience perspective. You're dealing with uh, also, again, a very unpredictable audience. And I'm sure there are on occasion you have an audience member who just doesn't want to go, you know, doesn't want to follow the route that you've, you've you know, put out for them, um, you know, as, as a theme park attraction. And in this instance, you know, what are the kind of the tips and tricks that we should be thinking about applying into the VR environment to help kind of corral the audience, so to speak? Well, thank you for that. It's uh a very interesting subject. We're lucky being in the outer home entertainment sector that we have actually dealt with this using virtual reality technology already. Mm. The projects uh, that I worked on with back in the phase three of virtual reality and now projects that we're seeing just starting to be deployed have used the process of an interactive narrative. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of the problems that we're dealing with, this is a problem that the theme park industry has had to deal with as soon as they started to include agency into the experience. The same way that the film industry, as well as b- before all of this theatre, had to understand that if you were going to create a branching narrative with um, m- uh, multiple possible endings, that you needed to have some control of the agency or it became chaos. Mm. So we've seen with some plays uh, in the past the use of God a uh, 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 narrator, but from our point of view in the outer home entertainment sector, we've always had something called the attendant, the, uh, the narrator, the navigator, the individual that leads the audience, be it the jungle cruise where it's the person steering the boat and also pointing out where to look to see all of the unique animatronics, or it's the person 
uh, telling you to look that way or that way to avoid certain dangers. Uh, the reason why Star Tours The Simulator Ride has that CP3O character at the front of the interactive motion ride is to steer the audience perception. Some people get it straight away and don't need a narrative. Other people don't. Mm -hmm. And then there's another fundamental aspect that we need to be careful with here that separates what we do in out of home with what you're doing in consumer. We deal with audiences. The consumer application, because of the limitations of the technology, will not be able at this current time to deal with large numbers of audience. So you're dealing still with a very singular individual experience. Hey, you look over there compared to some of the things that we have to deal with. Hey, the audience look over there. And again, you have to ask the question about do you lead, do you steer, or do you encourage? And this is where uh, binaural stereo audio comes into the situation. This is where some of the tricks that we're seeing in VR film creation. Uh, there were some very good presentations at the Digital Hollywood uh, event last year that uh, we were able to uh, uh, partake with. And they were telling, telling us some of the tricks that they're now employing, the little dots, the sweet spot, the, uh, the de-resing of the surrounding area to encourage the audience to follow the narrative. Jeff, what's your take on this in terms of that, that kind of do you lead, do you encourage, that, you know, what's your uh, take on this from an individual versus an audience perspective? Obviously, <coughs> from a consumer perspective, we are talking about, you know, a kind of a one-on-one -on -one experience, and yet we as writers are still thinking of them as audience. Well, that's uh, uh, what I was going to really address. The fact that um, uh, VR is going to have to cause uh, storytellers to, to shift um, uh, the, the way that they are, um, are creating these narratives. We actually have to make something of a, a psychological uh, leap um, uh, the, because it, it, it hinges on the user experience. So it's not, uh, let me tell you the story, um, which, is, uh, which hap you happen to be present for inside the environment of the story. Um, it's, it's more about, here's what is happening to you, and what do you do about it, okay? Um, uh, so, so the narrative has to um, uh, uh, focus on the, the person who is uh, experiencing the narrative, and it has to lead uh, the person through the narrative by asking questions or setting up questions, um, if not didactically, at least with regard to what it is that they're seeing and experiencing. And that all has to focus on the person. That's a very different way of, of telling the, the story. Um, as far as corralling uh, the, the audience, um, uh, one uh, element that I've taken from uh, having run uh, any number of role-playing games where, where all of my players, my, my real-life flesh-and-blood players, have enormous agency and take great pleasure in, in walking away from the narrative <laughs> and, and trying, to break <laughs> my, trying to break my world mm -hmm. by, by running off in a different direction, um, uh, we can take a cue from, from the techniques that, that these uh, game masters or referees uh, um, uh, apply to their uh, role-playing games by uh, uh, creating the illusion um, that choice exists. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, in other words, the, the VR experience will have to uh, refold itself around the audience member, the participant, in order for the plot to continue to unfold. There will have to be a mechanism that, that makes you believe that you're walking away, and yet circumstances uh, uh, kind of re-manifest so that you can uh, uh, get back into the story. Phil, I'm curious to hear from you in terms of your, your experiences with creating these kind of MMO worlds and, and RPG environments. Obviously, from a game perspective, we're very familiar with this idea of kind of leading our players through a narrative experience. So as Jeff kind of refers to this idea of kind of the, the artificial hope of the fact that you have agency when in fact you don't really have very much in the way of agency. I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, I think it's really, really important to, to if we consider the sandbox, 
Um, uh, consider multifaceted sandbox. Possibly, if the sandbox is New York City, then anybody who wants to put their virtual reality like um, experience into New York City, uh, they all sit there so people can explore different things. Players are very, very. Um, uh, or, or people who engage in things are very, very up for like rewards for their experience. And the rewards can just be the experience themselves or they can be something else. So if we look at uh, Verhoeven's Total Recall where Arnie's in the chair and he gets to choose all the things that he wants from his experience. I think that's something along the way lines that we need to go. And so, you know, if somebody says, oh, I'd, I'd really, really like um, a, a coffee from this great coffee shop that I go to for like taking part in the experience, then allow them to like go for that prize. Do the trophy things that games do so that people like when they come out of the experience, they go, oh, I learned that part about that story, but I've still got all these other stories to explore, all these other experiences. Because because realistically, when I write in the in the MMO worlds that I create, and when I, I've been role playing, and I've been I've been games mastering since I was eight, and, and I, I killed my first person when I was nine, <laughs> um, uh, I I I've I've always made sure that everybody can engage in something that is is needful for them. It's it's something that they really really want to experience, and so um, sort of focusing on something that Kevin said as well. Um, if you have this sort of fairground, this carnival going on, then then the things are the things that um, identify the person to like go towards things uh, are the bright lights. They they go for the bright lights. They go for the different experiences that stand out. You will get one or two people who want to see what the grass is doing underneath the fairground rides, but but you can't cover every base in these type of experiences. But you can give them this sort of full, full, massively immersive experience where each time they go into the experience, they learn a little bit more. And and they get really, really excited about going back into the experience to finish off these stories to get their rewards in whatever way they want. I'm interested because you kind of picked on something that, Rihanna, I'm going to throw this one at you um, because I think you, you probably have more experience with this, but um, just talking there about kind of the, the total recall kind of approach of, of implanting the memory and that whole thing of, you know, what well, I want to be, you know, a spy on Mars and, you know, I want, I want the, you know, hot girl and you know, all that kind of stuff that he's picking in terms of his experience. And then he's, you know, supposed to hypothetically in you know, total recall world, you would go and you would live out that memory or you'd have that memory implanted. So whenever you want to go back and revisit that, it's exactly as you kind of had highlighted in terms of those key findings of, of the things that you want to definitely include and it brings me to this question because I know obviously with gaming one of the, the big things for for any game um, certainly MMOs or RPGs is, is this whole avatar creation this idea that you know I get to pick who I am I get to define what my character looks like what guild I am you know the the, the, the features and the traits of my character do you think that that, that there is potentially that transition in into vr as well where somebody's going to say you know what i i want to be you know by the serene lake and i i want to you know be able to see the swan gliding on the lake and 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 you know to be able to give them that sense of ownership of their you know virtual environment to a certain extent do you think that's going to be become a thing possibly i think we're a long way off yet and, not, and obviously for every game where you get to you know, choose your character and, and their hair colour and their class and things like that, there are games where you step into the shoes of an of, of established character. It, it, it's kind of the choose your own character thing is, is sort of, you know, it's, it's properly role-playing. It's a, a blank slate character that you inhabit. And I think that's, that's obviously where VR games are going first because obviously you're looking out the eyes of, of that particular character. Now, I don't, I don't know how much has been done with controlling a, a, um, a third-person character in that environment. Um, so, so, for example, if it was something like Tomb Raider, you would see Lara sort of directly in front of you, as if you were expect of playing it on a game, um, uh, you know, a, a regular game on the console. So, but, but when you ran Lara around, and when you kind of you know, swung your, your um, hands or things, Lara did as well, whether well, there's a sort of whether we can still have that stepping into the shoes of the character experience and you're more like a puppet master for that character. I think that's got some interesting um, narrative ramifications as well. I think we're 
bit of a, a long way off the kind of choose your own experience. And as storytellers, it kind of dilutes, I think, what some of what we want to do. And, and for every you know, for every player that wants an open world and likes RPGs, there are ones that like a more cinematic, more linear experience. They want to be taken on a journey. They don't necessarily have the time or inclination to be finding everything or, or wanting to keep going back into the world or wanting to group with other players. They just want this sort of you know, linear experience with maybe a little bit of space to play, but basically they kind of want to be taken on a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's always got to be choice for, for different players who want different things. And I think that we will probably be doing... Um, you know, a lot of those journey things first. Uh, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how something like No Man's Sky, which is sort of loads and loads of procedurally generated worlds, with not that much narrative involved and a lot of exploration, that feels like it could transfer into VR um, really well. But I think we've, got, we've still got such a long way to go in game storytelling. And game storytelling, I think, is the nearest to VR storytelling because of how used to um, we are to, to factor in the player in as, as you know, the most important person in the story. We're kind of used to doing that, and we've still got quite a long way to go in, in games itself. So I think um, you know, VR is, is sort of one step beyond, and we can take in all the techniques that we've learned in, in game storytelling and bring in other techniques from other mediums and sort of fold them together. Um, but for, you know, for every player that wants a choice, there's ones that just want a journey, you know, a journey, a story that you have woven from for them, rather than that they have to weave themselves. So I think that's a possibility, but I don't necessarily think that's going to be appealing for all consumers. Mm, well, you've got me thinking about a holodeck feature now. <laughs> but I'm I'm curious to, to hear from from perhaps you, Kevin, in terms of this idea that actually when it comes to the types of VR experiences that we're seeing at the moment in terms of um, the high profile what, what's making a lot of you know waves in the press and, and such like at the moment there does tend to be an awful lot of this kind of reoccurring theme of it's it's you know very high profile because it's got you know lots of flashing lots of bangs lots of big explosions and and lots of CGI but not necessarily a huge amount in the way of storytelling and I'm curious to understand, um, because I think Rihanna's got a point to a certain extent, which is that we're pro- it's probably going to be a little while before people really start to focus on story and narrative in an uh, empathetic and meaningful way um, when it comes to these VR environments. I think there's still going to be a lot of this, let's just explore, let's just you know show you a, a situation that you can go and explore this sandbox. Or you know when it comes to 360 film, for example, I think there's going to be a lot of this, you know let's just stick a camera in the middle of the action and document what's going on versus actually you know articulating a story with character and and story and narrative and i'm curious to hear from you kevin in terms of what your thoughts are on that well it's uh, an interesting argument I, i'm i'm going to live up to my reputation and, and <laughs> argue that um really the video game side has borrowed most of its narrative and uh, and key genres from the amusement industry, and the amusement industry comes from the uh, the mechanical gaming sector. So don't forget your history, because you'll be cursed to repeat it. The, the the core sectors here that we're seeing is the one narrative that many people are borrowing from, but they don't like to admit it, for the early virtual reality experiences that we're seeing, is from the 4D theatre market. Mm-hmm. So those experiential theatres that... Uh, offer you physical effects while watching a 3D film that are incredibly popular in many theme parks and entertainment facilities, have a wide selection of films created, CGI films, three minute long. And a lot of those developers have worked out the tricks of enthralling uh, an audience and encouraging to achieve a level of engagement with a narrative behind it that is just right for the duration of experience or in the case duration of play. So a lot of knowledge is going to come from the current video games industry, but also a lot of the, the, to use your phrase, the bangs and the flashing lights, the approach to enthrall people will come also from that sector. And that sector is a very interesting one. Some of the tricks that are deployed in 4D uh, CGI films go back to the earliest points of the cinema industry in just creating an enjoyable narrative. If that is the case, I'm interested to hear from you, Charlie, because 
you obviously you, you're working in this live uh, environment and you're working with these these audiences your experiences are somewhat longer than two or three minutes though so I'm, I'm curious to understand from your perspective do you see this as something that needs to be slimmed down for vr yeah i think um having worked working with the guys up in the uk who were who are about to do this zombie htc vive thing which is you know a 15 minute game that you play, but they've wrapped a live experience at the beginning and the end. Mm. Um, and I'm interested to see how it goes. I won't be able to see it up there, but um, maybe you'll be able to, Tanya. But having talked with them a bit about them putting it together, you know, the, the VR side of it has to be quicker. It, 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 um, people at this stage, because it's not, a, not engaging enough, it isn't engaging enough to tr genuinely hold people's attention for, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes. That, that's how long these experiences are. You remember with the Generation of Z, what we did is we simply stole and ripped a whole lot of techniques and uh, ways of doing things from different industry so a little bit from um you know the the indiana hollywood the Holly, the indiana jones theme park you know experience we ripped a bit of that we ripped a bit of live video gaming we ripped a bit of film quality special effects that are happening all around you we ripped a bit of immersive theater techniques and traditional theater techniques with diversion then we ripped a bit of video gaming scripting so we by bashing all those together it created something that's you know a little bit different um and but all those things have been done in isolation to their full capacities. Um, I think, I, I do think that with, with adding VR into the mix with, with a live set or a live environment or there's live actors and all of a sudden you've got to put the glasses on. And, you know, we talked a lot about that and we never could find a genuine, elegant justification in our live story so that for this technology to A, be there or B, be um, have the audience then interact with that. Now, mm. these guys up in the UK may have found a different solution to that. And I definitely think, you know, we were looking at um, developing, getting Alien Wars going again with the Alien franchise <laughs> live show. And yeah. so we can right now, through the Immersia technology, put screens in buses or screens in a, in a, in a Gravitron, which will take people to zero gravity, and um, in real time, put things on fire outside, um, basically make people believe that they're in space. So we can take people up into space, chuck them in a massive warehouse, and, you know, it's Battlestar Galactica or it's the Alien franchise. Um, Again, with that, there always, to me, has to be this live, tactile interaction with, with, with actors. And our little point of difference on that with Gen Z, and I haven't really seen it since, neither in a theme park experience or anywhere else, is the quality, the professional quality of those actors. Um, and a lot of the, the kind of horror houses or that, you know, it's fa they're made by fanboys for fanboys. And there was an amateurish um, element to some of the stuff that we have seen and was going on. And, and our kind of point of difference was to bring a real professional edge to it, mm -hmm. you know, real, real acting. And this isn't theatrical acting. This is real tears. We can grab them for an hour and a half if it's intense enough and, we, and there's enough going on. Mm -hmm. And I don't think VR yet has the ability to be intense enough or have enough going on to sustain someone's attention for an hour 20 one hour um, but I do think it will happen I, I do um, but as we've said you know we are at Pong um, <laughs> but that's just from my experience anyway and I'm sure there's always another angle to look at it another way you know there's, mm -hmm. there's a million ways you can attack something obviously so we're all attacking it from our own little areas but that's one of the beauties of the reasons why we have all of these different people in this mix today. But I am actually curious to understand, because you've mentioned this, this, this need for the kind of the tactile interaction with the actors. And, um, and I know that, Rihanna, you was mentioning about kind of motion capture and are we going to see a, a kind of a resurgence of that need for, um, you know, mocap performance or, or even FMVs, you know, back in the day. Um, you know, that was, that was very much a kind of a... A meat, and, uh, a meat and potatoes kind of element of any decent game in the 90s was you'd have a you know really beautiful cut scene that, that was actually more linear in its storytelling than than you know most most uh, movies were um i'm curious to, to hear your uh, thoughts on this rihanna um, well, look, there are also some very cheesy games that utilised FMV, but FMV in the early 90s wasn't sort of just a cutscene, it was actually using real actors in the game. So, mm. um, you know, one of the most famous to do it was uh, Wing Commander, which um, uh, used Mark Hamill and uh, the guy that plays Biff from Back to, uh, Back to the Future, 
Uh, and yeah, there's a few like Phantasmagoria. Um, some were more successful than others. It, the, uh, I, I really have a soft spot for the Wing Commander games. <laughs> um, and Westwood used, used some of it in the uh, Dune and, and Command and Conquer games. And um, that was really the precursor of mocap in some ways, in that you were kind of capturing performance, but it, it was it was felt very removed from the player. It added to the kind of overall immersion, but it wasn't as effective as, as mocap performance is today. And I do think um, it's you know uh, mode capturing performance is is going to be uh, even more important in VR once we get to that stage. Um, having worked on a number of games, I mean, Heavenly Sword, I think, was the first game to ever mo-capture facial and body um, performance at, at the same time, and then that was sort of later used for the Uncharted games. And, you know, we had, we got a great response from players because we were being able to capture that sort of fidelity of performance. And it wasn't just voice, it was about, you know, the whole... Yeah, the whole act of acting out the performance, and, and obviously Andy Circus was our, our dramatic director for that, and he took all the cast down to Weta, and you know they they had a great time in all the, the mo capture suits, and I think that you know we get we'll start seeing a lot more of that in VR because you know you're right there in the world with that that character, and so it, it feels like you know a, actors and fully acting out characters in games is going to, that's going to be become more commonplace, I think. I'm curious, actually. I'm going to ask you this question, Kathleen, because you are um, also an actor in, in the many hyphenates that you are. Actor is one of those things. And I'm curious from your perspective, because, you know, we're, we're getting to that, that, that point where actually being an actor for VR, it will be a very particular skill set in the same way that you have, you know, actors who are particularly skilled as a theatre actor or a film actor or, you know, um, they're, they're very specific things that they do and they do incredibly well. And VR is, is almost, I think, going to become a new category in and of itself because it is that, almost that combination between kind of being able to do live immersive theatre but also being able to do the green screen thing as well and the mocap thing. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, I agree. I think that it's going to be its own form of acting. It's, it's going to take on a life of its own. I mean, there's this really wonderful story about Tyne Daly uh, who had done... Um, oh gosh, what was that? Some TV show for years, cop TV show for years, and she got back to Broadway. And the first thing she did was stand in the center of the stage and stretch her arms out wide and say, oh God, it feels good to do this again, which you just can't do on camera. So it's, it's a very different set of skills. And I think that you hit the nail on the head in terms of talking about needing to be able to do that interactive, uh, I'm in the room with the audience and they are... Uh, they, I need to interact with the camera as if it is the audience. Uh, and I need to do that as an actor. You need to do that Bible that we were talking about mm. the, the, it, when we were talking about distant mountains. That it, you, know, you need to know exactly <laughs> not to go back to the mouse under the couch, Schrodinger's <laughs> mouse, as Phil called it. But you need to know whether or not it's there, whether or not it's there for the audience to see you need to know that world that completely mm -hmm. and yet you st and and that is the i think the most successful actors and successful in terms of us forgetting that they're actors and and buying into that they are actually these people they're portraying that that they do that already you then also have to have the sense of where the camera is and what you can and cannot do on camera. So, so it really is a blending of a lot of, of different skills and will become a, you will see in the future acting for VR classes available. <laughs> Which brings me to this whole kind of real distant future in a way that um, we brought this up actually with some of the actors who were attending Comic-Con last year and we kind of threw this at, as a random question at them which is this idea of actually what happens when we get to that stage where you can just, as an actor, you just roll out of bed and you go into, you know, a special room in your house somewhere that you've got set up and the motion capture and the, the kind of VR capture will just be in that room. And you will never have to step, step onto a set with any other actors. You can just act from your, your living room and be participant in a film because of the nature of this, the technology. I'm curious, Charlie, what your thoughts on, on something like that are? 
I'm I'm still stuck on this experience that needs to be created called the mouse under the couch. <laughs> Shaving um, his mouse yeah, look, <laughs> is a <performance>, thing. <laughs> yeah, the um the the performance technique definitely will will change and have to mm. change. And I, I mean, it would be amazing. Imagine that you sort of wake up. It's five thirty in the morning. It's your call time. You roll out of bed. You put your suit on. You know, your whole room's at the studio and all of a sudden, you know, you're virtually beaming in to be, you know, you're Benedict Cumberbatch and you're Smile the Dragon, you know, and you're in your bloody, in your <laughs> living room. That's that's pretty cool. I mean, I'm really interested to uh, find uh, a way where the performers, because to me, to create the experience for VR um, at the moment, as, the way I would do it is set up an entire set that looks real. You know, say you're making Lord of the Rings VR, you sit, you go to those Yes, they've made the 2D sh experience, but we're doing a VR experience at the same time as an additional piece of content. They've got all those wonderful sets already there. Um, I would be shooting three, all the actors with the 360 camera in the middle, uh, you know, being spoken to. Um, so that creates a different type of performance technique. However, not too much different because it is just like immersive theater where you're breaking the fourth wall and, you know, except the audience that you're talking to is the camera. But I'm more interested at in looking at what happens if the actors themselves are the 360 cameras, both outward and inward. Mm. Um, what, what happens when they're walking around this environment and everything, every single Thing is being filmed. So like mocap, which is all these sensors looking inward to create a virtual representation, what if those sensors can also look outward? So they become, those sensors are going out, um, which, which become the 360 cameras. Because at the moment, we met with the head of um, Samsung. So we just saw yesterday, it was on Tuesday actually, after our discussion, the, the new 360 camera going straight to the new Galaxy S7. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's about, they're gonna re, they don't know exactly, but it'll be about $700. So this is going to proliferate the market. With, we never know, said a price. We never said that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Continue, John. However, Continue. <laughs> it's probably going to be under a thousand dollars. So <laughs> affordable for people to start proliferating, making their own 360 content. It stitches all in real time. There isn't a huge process that you have to go through with this current GoPro 360 rigs, which can, you know, it's just hours and hours of editing. Mm. So I'm interested for that for the technology to move forward with the performer. And as I've said before, this is such a big bugbear for me at the moment, which is the technology must be created alongside and with in the the same room, the creative and the IP. For so long, there's, everyone's in their silos making their awesome stuff, but there's not a lot of this talking together. And, and the best things that I've seen have been because they develop the technology alongside the, the creation of the story. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I, I don't really, I don't have an, probably an answer to your question there. But, I, I do. <laughs> but it's interesting uh, it's that a, you bring this up, Charlie. And the reason I say this is because, Steve, I was speaking to your CTO today, ironically, about this very thing. <laughs> um, and that is that the fact that actually the technology does need to keep pace with the, the, the creative intention. And he was talking, sorry, his name is Matt, for those who are listening. Um, Matt was talking about this, this um, notion that actually even if we start teaching people now about how to you know, record in 360 and then stitch that, that, that composition together to be able to create a 360 video. Actually, that's going to become obsolete relatively quickly because we're going to get to a stage where actually the cameras are just going to do this stuff for you. So stitching won't be an issue that we need to teach people how to figure that stuff out because actually give it a year and the technology will just leapfrog straight over that. And I'm curious, um, Steve, what are the kind of technological advancements you think are going to be happening alongside this this desire for creativity that we're seeing? Uh, that's right. I think uh, I think Matt was absolutely correct. Um, I think it's interesting that the that the technology all is actually going forward at such a pace, um, and I think that's the difference now from uh, what uh, virtual reality was uh, twenty five years ago, uh, when the technology couldn't keep up, uh, couldn't keep pace with the imagination, uh, and now I think uh, technology can, um, and there's going to be lots of things which are going to help us uh, be able to tell stories, help us uh, to be able to do things now which require quite a lot of um, uh, input, such as uh, at the moment sort of stitching uh, a live action VR together. Um, there are cameras out there now that actually don't require stitching. Uh, they're quite expensive, but uh, they'll get into the consumer market. Um, really, uh, Samsung's uh, new camera actually does that right now. 
So it's going to be very interesting to see what uh, what happens in that respect. Um, in terms of uh, how it's going to help us tell stories and how it's going to help us create um, uh, various scenarios, um, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to go. It's going to make it very, very different. Talking about motion capture, I was talking to some guys um, from China who have a thing called uh, perception neuron. Now, perception neuron is that, in actual fact, a, a, a consumer motion capture suit. Um, and we tried that on uh, the other week, and it works fantastically well. So they're actually sort of doing it for two markets. They're actually doing it for the professional market, and they're also doing it for the consumer market. So there's going to be lots of things like that coming out. Wow, I'm actually fascinated because now I've just got images of you and Matt in, in mocap suits. <laughs> well, it, well, it's it, it's more sort of like a uh, sort of bondage wear than the suit. <laughs> lots of strappings involved. That's all I'll say. Goodness gracious! But I am curious, Jeff, from your perspective, when we're um, we're thinking about what the technology needs to do in order to keep up with the creative and narrative intention. What do you think are the kind of the key significant things that need to happen? And and I say this on the basis of things like, as a, for example, from my perspective, sim sickness is obviously a thing that we need to get over. But even the basics, you know, I as somebody who wears glasses cannot bear wearing certain head, you know, HMDs, head mounted displays, because it's just it's just uncomfortable to shove this, this this headset on my head and it just crushes my glasses into my face. And and that alone puts me off. You know, at the end of a long day of having done lots of different demos, I get to a stage where somebody says to me, do you want to put that on? I'm just like, no, just don't make me put another headset on. <laughs> you know, um, I uh, was involved in the creation of one of the first video games to use a uh, the, this little box of forced feedback. Um, uh, one of the early Turok uh, uh, video games oh, buzzed nice. when you when you used your your controller, mm. uh, the Nintendo uh, uh, box, and and gave you a little jolt, and and that was awesome. <laughs> um, uh, we we're going to need these worlds to push back at us. Mm. Uh, we're going to need to to feel as if we have efficacy in these worlds by by somehow being able to touch things, uh, perhaps initially in a rudimentary fashion, but eventually um, in, in something uh, more, more spectacular. Um, and so the, the science of haptics and, and haptic techniques, gloves, uh, are things like that, that will enable us to um, uh, feel as if we can push things around and, and do things in these worlds is going to be uh, very, very important. Um, um, I agree that we also are going to see um, uh, things like uh, uh, visual enhancements, voice enhancements, um, uh, uh, things that will um, uh, in induce uh, psychologically the, the idea that we um, uh, have skills beyond that which we have walking into the experience. Mm. Uh, you know, and that's not just for big, giant science fictions. It could be for genre uh, uh, kind of uh, experiences. I'm curious, though, because, you know, you're talking about haptics, and, and Kevin very helpfully has, has mentioned the void. And, um, and I, I am curious because I know a few people now who've talked about this void experience. And the one thing that, that a lot of filmmakers, and I'm being very specific here in terms of filmmakers who've gone into the void, um, sorry, for, for those listening who don't know what The Void is, The Void is basically an experience based out in LA that uh, has a haptic suit that you put on and, and you know, it's a, it's a VR immersive experience that you, you know, you literally put the computer on your back, essentially, so that you can wander around in the environment. Um, but the, the one thing that I note that a lot of the filmmakers who've gone and experienced The Void have said is, this is freaking cool. This is amazingly cool. Oh. Thank you for the correction, Steve. Utah, not LA. My bad. Um, but the the problem for a lot of these filmmakers is they think this is really, really cool, but they have no idea how to use it. You know, it's like the, the one thing that most of these filmmakers are kind of saying is, okay, this is great, but what next? You know, what do I do with it? And I am really curious to understand from, from that perspective, yes, haptic is a thing that we probably need to be thinking about. But how do we as you know, writers and 
story creators utilize these peripherals in a, in a meaningful way. And I, and I use that word meaningful um, because I do think there is this danger of there's a lot of bells and whistles that we can add to this experience for sure. But is it necessarily something that, that is going to enhance the story? Could I jump in here, Tanya? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people haven't had a chance to see The Void and we're lucky enough to be working with uh, some of the companies that are, are looking at it. Without going into too much detail and without really breaking any of the embargoed uh, information on it, the reason why Harrison Ford and Steven Spielberg at the TED event were so wowed about it, the reason why so many film directors have looked at this technology of The Void and gone, hey, this is present, it's not just because it can use fancy, expensive technology where the consumer systems are limited. It is the linking between tactility, mm -hmm. real world, and the virtual experience. So through the trick of uh, directed walking, the individual moves through a space, can feel walls, and even feel special effects as they progress through the CGI experience that they're seeing on the special head-mounted displays powered by the supercomputers that are resting on their backs. Mm. And for, for a film director, this is really what they want. This is direct narrative, the ability to walk through the Starship Enterprise and feel the sides of the walls, the ability to walk through Indiana Jones's uh, temple and feel the uh, iconography on the side of the walls. Mm. And sadly, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I, I have a vested interest here, guys. You know, I, I, I am the problem <laughs> child here. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what the virtual reality boys have been promising since this latest phase of VR has not really materialized as, as was advertised, shall we say. And that was a little bit of the problem of the failure of virtual reality the last time around where, you know, when people at Nintendo were claiming that the virtual boy was, uh, you know, virtual reality. <laughs> um, yes. and, and now we're talking about room scale VR and, you know, again, it's, it's there, but unless you're doing a painting tool you're not really getting it with the void and the void isn't the only um arena based or, or should i say arena scale vr experience there's companies such as zero latency mm -hmm. in australia there's companies like motion tech uh, and vr arcade uh but the void is the one that's getting a lot of the publicity and especially after the money that it's just raised to open over 30 facilities including multiple sites in china they're the ones that are the poster boy at the moment. But my, my question is this, is that that's great, but in terms of scalability, in terms of consumer scalability, how do you take an experience like that and really make it meaningful to Joe Bloggs, everyday Joe Bloggs, who isn't going to go to a fancy room with you know all of the special effects and the CGI effects that, that need to happen and, and be able to strap on this, this haptic suit and this big old supercomputer in order to facilitate the experience? You know, what happens... In, in terms of for, for general Joe Bloggs consumer who's probably, you know, com just about stretched to maybe get in a cardboard or possibly a Samsung gear, you know, if they really want to put some money into it, how are they going to really get, in, get, get any kind of benefit from something like this? Is my question. That's a big uh, question, actually, Tanya. That, um, when I was uh, working in games writing full time, um, this was around about the time that uh, Valve were, uh, you know, rumored to be working on their VR goggles. And of course, we know we know how that one turned out. Um, but there was a lot of reports. I believe it was a, a, a journalist based in New York. I may mm. be wrong on that, but he was invited actually out to uh, Valve's headquarters in Seattle. And um, he, he described the, the, this room, which was uh, basically wallpapered with QR codes and, uh, you know, the, these sort of labs where they were, they were making, you know, just full of uh, uh, bits and you know, nuts and bolts, people tinkering with hardware and whatnot. And I, I remember reading this and just thinking, what is this product going to look like on a shelf in, for, for example, I don't know, Argos or something, right? Mm. Um, what, what, Target, what is the American the actual, audience. <laughs> yes, yeah. What what is the actual package though? Is it? Just, is it? I mean, if we're talking about though that level of experience, it isn't just the headset. Mm. There may be motion tracked, uh, you know, um, sort of like joysticks in each hand to control hand movement, you know, and to to, to uh, gauge depth of field and whatnot. Um, is it just a pad? Uh, if it's just a pad, then does that then take a step back from this? Uh, this uh, grand sort of pipe dream of, of uh, you know, motion control and whatnot, are we taking a step back by putting a pad back in people's hands when really what we're trying to do with VR is get people away from that? 
um, or is there a happy medium? Of course, it, it, it was a very it was a very interesting conversation around that time about what what would come out of the box with something like Oculus, for example, mm. because all these developers were using different. I mean, they were experimenting, of course. They they, they were just taking bits of existing tech, different controller uh, methods. They were even making their own uh, for their own VR experiences. So. I think that's that's where things like consoles are different because you get it's a single platform. Everything you need to run games on that platform is in that box. Mm. Whereas VR, of course, depending on the the the, the size and the, the scale and the interactivity of the experience, uh, that's a very different tool set that you need. Um, and I think I think the more you start to pile on, you know, backpacks and wearables, you know, you know, these can be done quite well. But I think the more you pile on, you, you're going to risk uh, lowering immersion. Um, I think it just depends on very much the, the, the kind of narrative story we're trying to tell. Um, but it's something that does need to be defined better. Okay. So, um, Tanya, this is uh, Jeff. Um, uh, I think we can take a lesson from uh, what happened when uh, the video game industry began to import uh, Hollywood screenwriters uh, to tell stories uh, w within their console games. Uh, there was a, a lot of disaster, <laughs> um, and um, and that's because uh, the screenwriters thought, oh, uh, it's a virtual environment. I, I can I can write anything, and and of course there are uh, even in the most expensive uh, console video games, there are all kinds of uh, technological limitations uh, that require uh, you to write in a in a very specific way. Um, uh, we're going to uh, advance ourselves creatively in VR when good writers um, are, are also uh, uh, open to and trained to uh, be sensitive to the um, uh, technological limitations of, of the medium or, or the individual uh, platform within the, the, the medium. And, um, and that's going to, uh, to take a lot of uh, communication. Absolutely. Which, which actually br brings me back to the question I was literally about to ask. You preempted me, Jeff. Um, which was, in closing, because this is, we, we are now at, okay, we've definitely gone over our limitation of time for this session. And I know it's the last session. So therefore, what I want to do is I, I want to take it back to, to our listeners and to the people who've, who've sat through all four hours of, of these sessions and sitting there thinking, you know what, I've, it's great and it's been really interesting, but I'm still not sure where to start. I, I would ask each of you, from your own perspective of your own industry and in the context of VR, what would be the advice that you would give to somebody who is listening to this for the, you know, thinking about, I am a writer, or I am thinking about writing something, and I, I want to do this for VR, what would be that advice that you would give to them? What would be the, the, the gem or the nugget that you've taken from this, this process of the VR writer's room that you would say, actually, in summary, here's what I think you need to do? And I'm going to start with you, Charlie. I think you should go away and study as much immersive theatre as you can, preferably ones with story, not free roam. And I would also challenge you to go and read up and talk and ask questions and see people and take people for coffees who are working in the technology that is being created to create VR and then certainly AR. We won't touch that today because <laughs> that's uh, a whole nother whole uh, other, series. Whole other thing. A series. And, and, you know, that's my space is more in AR than technically VR. We are doing some, but I'm, you know, that's mm. where I'm heading. Um, and more well, mixed reality, really. But, um, yeah, I think it is. To me, the techniques that uh, are close, closest aligned to what VR requires is immersive theatre techniques in terms of story, uh, not just storytelling, but, you know, uh, performance techniques. And then just learn as much as you can about the technology and try, try and try again, fail, fall over, get up again. Like a video game, you can. So mm. good. Okay. And Phil, what would you say to any of our listeners who are trying to figure this, this whole VR thing out? Um, research. I, I keep talking about research uh, throughout these talks, and uh, I think it's really, really essential. You've got to research uh, what's happened in the past, what's failed. Um, 
Kevin sort of uh, noted things have failed in the past. And, and why have they failed? What, what have they missed? What have they not been able to engage with? What have they, uh, they, they failed to like capture? Um, uh, you've got to look at the engagement and, um, uh, and how important this is going to be to your users. And that research therefore goes out to the people who are going to like use your product and, and how they're going to engage with it and what their thoughts and feelings are. Um, I think the information's out there. I think you can find it, as Charlie said, in interactive theater. I think you can find it in uh, live action role playing. I, I think you can find it in many, many spheres and many, many places of light influence. But it, it's about understanding all of it. it, it you, you have to sit down and learn before you can uh, start to preach. That. Okay. And Kathleen, what would be your advice? So everything that Charlie said and everything Phil said, and then I would also say get really clear on character and really clear on story. Mm. That, and I think that's actually something uh, I think I might be stealing from Rihanna when I, when I say that. I think she said that at the end of another session. But you need to, you really need to, if you're going to ask people to buy into this, again, there's reality baked in to the name of this. It's virtual reality. And if you want people to buy into that reality, then it has to be very real for you. So get really clear on your characters, who they are, and get really clear on your story. What is it you're talking about? What is the journey you're taking your audience on? Okay. And Kevin, what would be your advice to somebody who's starting on this road? Well, I, I think uh, the panelists before me have, have touched upon the need for research. Uh, the under Some rules that all individuals that are breaking into new mediums need to understand is that no one has all the answers but uh, we have two eyes, two ears, and one mouth for a reason. Uh, my, my parents always pointed out to me, and sadly I never listened to, and we should do a lot more listening and a lot more looking up uh, regarding this. I feel that there's someone somewhere sitting in their bedroom uh, or uh, working very hard at a university that will put together the next major step that will make consumer VR work even better than it does at the moment, the narrative side. Mm. So the whole aim for people breaking into this sector is that they really got to keep banging those rocks together and they've still got to keep looking for that narrative that they understand and they can get to work in VR. Okay. And, and what about you, Dave? Well, just approaching it from a comic, uh, the, my comic work, um, um, I, I would definitely say yes to all the advice that's been given so far. But also, uh, just bear in mind that you are working in a visual medium. Uh, it's, it's certainly uh, in, in comics, you know, I, I do get asked a lot of questions about, oh, um, so I need to write a script for my comic, right? Uh, and just a few, a few bits, a few small descriptions about what's going on in the page. And it's like, well, you know, and we said this in the last session, it's, it's more than that. You need to think more like a director. Um, you know what? What is the framing? Uh, where are people standing? What's their body language like? You know, are, are you seeding some visual uh, hints and clues about what's going on in the world, about the world state? Don't just use uh, you know a, a narrative exposition to tell your story. Of course, you know, seed things in the backgrounds and the foregrounds, and just start thinking more about the the actual visual. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than what people are saying, don't fall back on exposition because it happens a lot in comics mm -hmm. um, due to their panel restrict restrictions. But um, I've seen some pretty lazy writing and world building as a result of that. So definitely one to avoid. Okay, good advice. Um, Steve, I'm going to come at you slightly differently in as much as you you're coming from this from a technical perspective rather than as a writer and, and you're giving us a little bit of balance from a, a technical perspective. I would ask you what your advice would be to somebody who is thinking about creating software or hardware for writers of VR and what would be the key features or things that they should be considering about that, bearing in mind that for VR writing you're talking about concurrent narrative development. Yes, that's very good. Uh, uh, very good, Tanya. You, you've given me the difficult bit there. Because, <laughs> um, uh, I was going to say that everybody else has given very good advice, and I think that uh, I'd start with sort of thinking about how you think of a story, whether it's going to be linear, non-linear. Um, think about pushing boundaries, and try, try, and try again. 
Now, to get round to the sort of the software that's going to help you, yes, I think it's something that we've talked about before, which is uh, you've got software now which helps you write uh, film and TV scripts, and you're going to need similar type of software to help you block out your ideas. Is it is it a linear story? If it's a non-linear story, how are all the threads going to go, and how can you keep track of all, the, all of all the various threads that you want to keep going all at one go, and how they interact with each other? Um, and it's going to take actually somebody who's incredibly intelligent to work that out. But I'm sure somebody's going to do it. Okay, so an open opportunity for somebody write the software for all these writers that want to write in VR. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and uh, Rihanna, what would be your advice to somebody who's uh, embarking on this uh, magical mystery tour of writing for VR? Well, there's certainly a lot more talks about VR at conferences all around the world in the games industry, so it's definitely something that the mind industry is exploring a lot, so go along to conferences like Develop, like GDC, um, Animex, Game Horizons, there's, there's great conferences all over the world and a lot of them are kind of embracing talks from um, people that are already working in VR, you know, make contacts, introduce yourself as a writer, get invited along to studios, see what people are doing. Um, I mean, it's the same way that you probably, for me, that I would advise people getting into the games industry. I go out there, see who's doing what, you know, think about what you can add to the process, what you can bring. A story as a storyteller mm. um, because it, you know we're, we're on the edge of it now so this is the time to start making connections and alliances and kind of getting in as we're, as we're starting to, to um, develop the technology I'm not sure whether we will ever see a, a script writing software for VR because I imagine it, it's going to be a bit like games and there's no real script writing software for games that can just be um, transplanted between different games because, you know, a first-person shooter has very different requirements from a, a strategy game, a strategy mm. game has different requirements from a puzzle game. You know, there, there's no one-size-fits-all, whereas with movies, the size limitations are, are, are to do with the page count, really, so, and that, so that's easy to kind of control. So it kind of works for movies in a way it doesn't work for games. However, you do get smaller in the... Um, kind of game writing software or, uh, and, and particularly story writing software like um, Twine, for example. Um, but they're, they're sort of, you know, quite quite low-level stuff. So I don't know whether we'll, we'll get to a stage where we'll see that, that, that kind of software for writers in VR. But it's all about making connections, really. So that's, that's probably my main point. Wonderful. And Jeff, what would be your final word on this for people who are thinking about getting into writing for VR? Where would they start? Uh, there, there's a, a kind of practical uh, piece of advice that I'd have to offer, and that would be um, that if you are a writer, if, if you've published professionally in, in some medium and are interested in moving into the VR writing uh, uh, medium, uh, well, first of all, you have to understand that it's, it's kind of hard to make any money at it uh, just yet. Uh, it's going to be uh, possible. And, uh, and it's going to be a really exciting field. Uh, one of the things that you can do to set yourself up well uh, to do that is to, um, is to follow the, the field extremely closely and then write about it. <laughs> um, there, there, are, there are a number of blogs about virtual reality. Uh, they tend to dwell on the technology or on uh, personal experiments in VR, but um, uh, not all that many about the, um, the uh, aesthetic creative uh, challenges, the narrative challenges that we're going to be experiencing. If you can uh, write regularly, observe what's out there, um, write about it in a, a kind of optimistic fashion, not necessarily a negative or, or critical fashion, but um, but also explain it clearly <laughs> so that you become a kind of thought leader in the field, that's going to um, be able to, uh, to get you some respect. And, um, and uh, people look for, for those who, who do have a kind of uh, a clean and clear handle on what um, uh, uh, VR writing is all about. Um, uh, post regularly, and um, and you will get uh, attention, and you'll become a thought leader in the field. Okay. 
So I want to thank everybody for participating in the VR Writers Rooms. Uh, it has been uh, an interesting journey for us over these four sessions, but probably what's, what um, a lot of people who are listening aren't necessarily aware of is that this is actually a, a wider group that has encompassed quite a few extra people who haven't necessarily participated in these podcasts, but has been an open discussion um, via Slack and, and on emails and in closed door conversations on Skype. And uh, eventually, at some point in time, further down the line, I'm pretty sure, Charlie, this is going to happen. Um, but uh, you will probably see some mention of some projects that are coming out of the VR Writers Room in terms of the participants who've, who've gone on to do other things. So we as Digital Jam will keep you informed about what these lovely people get up to in the wonderful world of VR. Uh, if you have questions and you would like to follow these wonderful people, um, then I'm going to ask them to kindly share their social media handle of choice so that you can do just that. And I'm going to start with Charlie. Hi, Charlie McDermott. You can find me uh, on Facebook, Charlie McDermott, Auckland, New Zealand, or please just send me an email if you need to, charlie at thegenerationofz.com. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you. And Dave, what would be your social media handle of choice? Yep, you can get me on Twitter at Dave S. Cook, or you can uh, check out my uh, comic label, uh, Card Shark Comics, on Facebook at forward slash Card Shark Comics, all one word. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, Kevin, how would people be able to get in touch with you or follow what you do? I'm old school, so they can follow uh, the developments in our sector on www.dna-association.com. And uh, my email details are there, so you can hunt me down if necessary. Wonderful, thank you. And Steve, what about your good self? Right, for me, it's a Twitter handle, which is AR Reality. That's A double R E A L I T Y. And also, you could Google my company, uh, Amplified Robot. Wonderful. And uh, shall we mention the Augmenting Reality Meetup since you are running the meetup? That would be very good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we hold monthly meetups uh, to talk about and uh, demonstrate and uh, experience everything to do with augmented reality and virtual reality. And uh, we've just uh, got to over 2,500 members um, in the UK. So uh, it's going very well. And if you Google that as well, augmenting reality, then you'll find where our meetup is which is normally somewhere in London. Absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. And Phil, why don't you tell us about your social media handle of choice? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Philip G. Harris, all one word. Um, uh, Philip, spelled with one L. Thank you. And Rihanna? Uh, you can find me at Ree Cratchit, R-H-I-P-R-A-T-C-H-E-T-T on Twitter, or um, you can contact me by my contact page at RihannaCratchit.com. Kathleen, why don't you tell us what your social media handle of choice is? So the best way to reach me is on Twitter at Kathleen Wallace, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-W-A-L-L-A-C-E. Wonderful, thank you. And, uh, and Jeff? Uh, connect with me on uh, Facebook, Jeff Gomez, or, or on Twitter, that's at Jeff underscore Gomez, at Jeff underscore Gomez. Remember the underscore, the other Jeff Gomez gets really upset <laughs> <laughs> wonderful well again um we want to thank you all for listening to the virtual uh, reality writers room uh and for joining us on these sessions if you uh, find this content interesting and you would like to hear more then feel free to subscribe and review uh we will be launching another room uh in the future w won't be necessarily writers could be directors we could be producers you never know but we will keep you in touch with what's going on with this group so feel free to follow us at digital jam ltd on twitter uh, and thanks again for joining us on this Digital Jam special. DigitalJamSessions.com